All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Coach Isaac Avon. I wanted to do a quick summary of applications and thoughts on the book, How We Learn to Move uh, by Dr. Rob Gray. Um, I just got just got through this book, been spending a lot of time thinking about it and using a lot of the stuff that he talked about in my training with my athletes. So I figured that I would um, spend some time going over some important things and uh, talking about what exactly this book is trying to convey. Uh, some talking points. So I want to go over a quick summary of the book. You know, I just, I think this whole presentation should be about five minutes, uh, seven minutes. Some key points from the book and thoughts on how strength and conditioning coaches can intervene. And lastly, problems with practices and how we can change it. So I first learned about this book um, from the Just Fly Sports podcast with uh, Coach Joel Smith. Um, he had Rob Gray on and he was talking about not just not just promoting the book, but he was talking about a lot of things that he talks about and he studies himself in his research um, with his athletes. Um, mainly, he just talked about short sighted games, um, cones and practices. And a lot of the things that he was speaking about was how he uses short sighted games his problems with cones and how he would restructure practices. And it got me thinking a lot um, on how strength and conditioning coaches and sport coaches in general can use a lot of the, the information that he was talking about to get their athletes to move better and to solve problems. Um, so really what the book is, is a, it's kind of a short book. It's about 220 pages um, on aspects and research on how we learn and get better at movement. So he provides a ton of research on things from uh, somebody swinging a hammer to um, how some athletes use goggles and how they performed after um, using certain interventions. And basically his whole thesis was how can we change our traditional approach to, to drills and practices um, to make a more open environment of learning uh, for our athletes so they can actually solve movement, uh, movement problems and create solutions that they would be using on the field, which I thought is really important. Um, the book talked a lot about reacting to our environment. So how do we use what's around us to create solutions? Um, perception, action, coupling. So, you know, that whole thing that we've learned about the OODA loop, um, seeing, processing, and creating action, um, but using those things together, not separating them, which is what the problem with cones have been, and changing our attractor states. So not reinforcing how athletes come back to things that they've been uh, doing beforehand, but changing what they uh, revert back to, to uh, outperform in the field. Uh, the book talked, went through theory, research, uh, specificity of his thoughts, um, thoughts on how he can change practice and how strength and conditioning coaches can change what they do and changes. And then the big overarching theme was how can we learn, how can we affect learning and performance as coaches and teachers in general? Because that's really what we are. We're performance coaches. Uh, some key points from the book um, talked a lot about the constraint based learning approach. Um, creating constraints, meaning um, changing, uh, you know, how the field is set up, how what they're allowed to do um, and using different implements and things like that. So athletes can learn different things. I think this is basically how we, how we strength condition coaches think of uh, short-sighted games. So when we, when we shorten the field, when we play capture the flag, we play tag or things like that, it's creating constraints um, and what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. Uh, so they can hopefully learn um, evading agility, cutting, um, working as a team, solving problems in an open environment. So he talked a lot about how he uses constraint-based uh, approaches with his VR, with his, his pitchers and his batters. He uses uh, constraint-based um, with his tennis players and things like that. He provided a lot of research on how using constraints is going to create those different attractor states and what I was talking about to create new movement. Um, and I was a big fan of that, of that CLA and what you talked about in the book and on the podcast, and I've been using it a lot. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that we can do instead of using, instead of using cones and things like that, what are some constraints we could put on the athlete that they're solving it? We're not giving them the solution, but they're creating the solution for themselves. That's an effective solution. That's really good for them, which is a big thing. What he's talking about, it's internal solutions, not us using a textbook solution and giving it to them. 
Um, then he talked a lot about the differential based learning approach. It was a little bit different. So for example, we talked about athletes wearing glasses that provide strobe lights, um, you know, using one hand, hopping on one leg to do practices. It's using different um, interventions in practice so that these athletes actually are doing things that they wouldn't do in the game, but putting them in massive, massively chaotic situations where they have to solve and have to perform and um, choose different actions that they would have chosen prior versus just having both legs, no glasses, things like that. And it's basically just um, using protuberations, things like that to see of how we can solve problems differently when we put in these chaotic isolations or chaotic um, situations. A lot of just using the brain and how that brain can fire differently to create a solutions, which I thought was a was an interesting thing that I haven't learned about before. Uh, variability in practice, and I thought this was huge. Um, what type of drills, what type of things are we doing in practice that is um, improving how we would actually see it on the field and in the game? You know, variability. A lot of the drills that we've done growing up you know, it, whether it be in the weight room um, or on the field, it, you know, they last for about 30 minutes and you're doing the same thing over and over again. You know what you're going to do. It's pre-planned, it's pre-programmed, and it's not very variable. You know, you sometimes, I remember looking at in college, looking at the practice structure, and it was about four different things. We'd spend like an hour, 30 to 45 minutes on each, each thing. And it was the same thing over and over again. It's like, are we actually improving on anything or are we getting the same thing and expecting that situation and just performing to the standard of that situation versus performing to the standard of sport and the chaos of sport. So we talked a lot about making sure that you have a ton of variability and a lot of different things because that's how we learn. Um, attractor states, cues versus interventions. Um, an interesting thing that Rob talked about was how when we give cues to our athletes when they're moving or cues when we're coaching them on the field the body hates cues and i think he talked about that, that was a france bosch quote but the the body hates hates cues uh that it hates coaching you know it doesn't like um trying to tell uh, tell them to do different things as like a dictator versus their own body is going to do it the way that they like to do it because they have those attractor states so what can we change in practice to 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 cause them to go away from those attractor states and develop new ones, which is a really hard thing to do. And that's why the constraint-based learning approach and differential-based learning approaches are so important because we can talk all day. We can do many hurdles. We can do, um, you know, step-ups with certain cues to the beat, to a whistle, but is that actually them learning something or them adapting to what you said? And then as soon as we walk away, they do it a different way. So what are they going back to, reverting back to? Um, reacting to environment to use movement solutions. Um, I think that this, this is huge. It's athletes scanning around and being able to reposition themselves on the field of play or in the con certain constraint-based environment that they're in and solving uh, problems using different movement patterns, which is huge. This is why that we, that's why we use short-sided games is because you're creating different environments that they're not that they're not using on the field that might be a little bit different than what they're used to so that they're having to process work together and do different things which is huge you talked a lot about how our body is also it already does well at reacting to environments and walking through a door uh, he talked about research with a pregnant lady who they kept sh uh, shortening the door and stuff like that and her body would just normal would just normally react and it would normally change the movement solution to get through the door effectively because it the body is used to doing that so when we put cones and things in front of that they're not reacting to an environment they're going to a cone and making decisions that they already knew they were going to make. So create an environment where they react. And then the most important thing was repetition to improve skill, not habit. We're here to improve their skills on the field, not their habits, which is going back to that uh, attractive thing. He talked, Dr. Gray talked a lot about how skill is, is adaptable. It's, it's constantly changing. It's, it's moving in all different ways when versus a habit, which is a set in your certain way. You know, you wake up and you do the same thing. That's a habit versus a skill of doing something is reactive. And it's, 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 it's a selling thing. It's I have skills that I can do on every team versus every situation because I have that skill. I have that adaptable thing I can change. So how are we improving their skills, not their habits? And I think a really important uh, quote from this book that Dr. Gray talked a lot about was, 
Um, in most sports, it is common for athletes to have to make unplanned movements. For example, a football defender needs to cut suddenly uh, when, a, when a ball player changes directions, a hockey goalkeeper needs to save a deflected shot. A volleyball player needs to alter their spike midair based on the position of the blocker. How well do we incorporate these type of movements in practice? Not very well at all in most cases. As a consultant, uh, one of the comments I find myself making a lot when observing practice activities is, well, that was a nice dance recital. When does practice start? Um, I thought that was pretty funny. This is uh, not in any way meant to put down the difficulty and skill involved in dance, rather to point out that in most practice drills, athletes know exactly what is going to happen. Movements have essentially been choreographed. They know where the tires or cones are going to be um, that they must go through, uh, when and where the coach is going to hit the ball that they must catch, et cetera. Everything is planned and predictable. And I thought that was just a great summary of what this book was about. It's athletes perform in chaotic situations. Our practices are very uh, pre-planned. What can we do to change that? And I think this is a great quote about that. Thoughts on how strength and conditioning coaches uh, can intervene. Um, cl so clearly we see a problem exists that traditional learning versus constraint-based learning approach. Um, people are making that switch. People are staying in the traditional uh, versus constraint-based learning approach. So this, the most simple thing is just going out and he Dr. Gray talked about him just walking past the field one time. And that's what inspired him to write this book. And he saw a bunch of, a bunch of cones out and kids just waiting in line. It's like, what, what are we doing? Are we actually promoting practice and learning a skill? Or are we just waiting to do something that we already didn't know we're going to do, which is going to be a half-assed drill? Um, so that's the importance of short-sighted games, constraint-based learning approach, games and drills. Um, you can look on my, on my page and you'll see a lot of uh, me using short-sighted games with my athletes. We, we, play, we play games every Wednesdays. Um, I think it's huge. My, my whole thing is uh, we don't play the game that you play, that you practice. We play different things. So you're learning to move differently and, you know, trying to get the brain firing and enjoying um, doing different things. And the athletes just love it. They're laughing. They want to play the whole time. So when we go lift, they're like, why can't we just play this the whole time? I think it's kind of funny that they would rather play this game than, you know, do lifts. It's because they're learning, they're moving, they're, they're actively engaging with the environment, which is awesome. Um, and you know, the constraint-based learning approach is like, you know, there's, how can we change form without, you know, making them do marches or things like that. So like implementing different things, um, so where they're, they're solving a solution, um, using an implement that we put in that makes most sense for them. And I think that's what sort side of games and certain, um, implementations with drills do well. Um, we think about something like the one by 20, the one by 20 by Dr. Michael Yeses, um, just, it, it promotes movement. It promotes, you know, them solving it themselves through many repetitions of completely variability. It's like, why do we think that the, why do we think the one by 20 works? It's because it's a lot, it's repetition of variability. And that's the most important thing that I learned from this book, external versus internal cues. It reminds me of a podcast that Dr. Or, um, Nick Winkleman was on. Yeah. Dr. Winkleman was on with, with uh, coach Joel Smith, when he talked about how we should be using uh, cues that are more um, analogy based versus telling them the angles of their knees and stuff like that. It's because they're going to, they're going to attract back to that anyways. So getting them to realize of, Hey, I want you to, I want you to punch that dumbbell. Uh, like you're going to put a hole through the roof versus I want you to keep it right by your ear the whole time and don't let it move uh, five degrees in front of you, five degrees behind using something where they can solve the problem by giving them something internally to think about and not just think about, okay, my knee needs to be over my toes, is, is going to be a lot more effective. Something that made me think about a lot was robots in the weight room or problem solvers in the weight room field. What are we as coaches doing um, in the weight room uh, to make them solve problems and learn movement in the weight room versus just being robots and just doing perfect form based on that NSCA textbook? Um, because when they leave us, are they using the things they learned or are we just, are we just there to do nothing? Making our jobs valuable is something that this book uh, really taught me. And just some closing thoughts. Um, something that I've been noticing lately is why are practices so long? I think if we use more variability and we restructure the way that we practice, um, you'll see that we don't need to practice for three hours. We don't need to put these kids through the absolute ringer where they're just learning drills, 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 day after day after day. And they're just practicing forever because how long does the practice need to be for these athletes to actually start to learn better and move better and play well in the field. 
And I think the CLA approach and, um, you know, variability in practice is and using different methods to teach these athletes versus just cones and drills and plays is going to make them learn a lot better and get a lot more bang for your buck. Um, does the sound of laughter and sight of movement mean athletes aren't working hard? I think that you, you see a lot of times with practice and um, in, you know, when some coaches use short side games, other coaches don't like it because sound of laughter and sight of movement is almost like they're not working hard. It's like, I would beg to differ. We play a game. I play uh, med ball, volleyball. I play uh, capture the flag. I play a tag with my athletes and they are moving hard. They are moving fast and they are reacting and they are doing things a lot better than they would be doing in practice. And we play for about 20 minutes and they're laughing and having fun because that's what sport is. That's why we have fun. That's why we do those things to learn. Um, next specialization versus exploration. We don't want these athletes to specialize in one thing. We want them to be able to explore a lot of different things. So when they end up specializing, becoming very good at a certain sport, they're so well-rounded. We think of athletes that play multiple sports growing up. Uh, your Kyler Murray's, um, your you know, Michael Jordan's. Those guys are those guys are great because they just they they move so well because they played so many things. Drills, the connotation of the word. When I say the word drills, I immediately think of cones. I immediately think of choppy feet and things like that. That's not what drills should be. You know, they should be in, in an open, exploring forum to where athletes can just move and to solve it their own way versus me blowing a whistle, me telling them how to cut and doing things like that, putting them in positions where they learn themselves how to cut and do those things. And two, two of my favorite things I like to leave when I, when I'm talking to uh, coaches or athletes is, was watching, just watch your athletes practice. You know, after a lift, I like to go out there and just watch my athletes practice and see how they move and see the different things that they're doing. See, see what I like about this practice, see what I don't like, see what, see how well the athletes are performing, see how well they're enjoying. And you can just see sometimes in their face when they do things they like. And sometimes it's just drill after drill after drill, watch your athletes practice. So you know how they should be moving and how you can make it better yourself. And last but not least, I think you just, just be a cultivator, um, of an environment of learning, exploring, and performing, which is one of the biggest things I learned from this book. Um, so obviously this went a little bit over um, <laughs> the, the five to seven minutes I was talking about, but I just think a lot of the stuff is really important. And I highly recommend uh, that you guys read this book and, Im and implement a lot of these things uh, with your athletes in practice. So thanks for listening. Hopefully you guys got out something about this and feel free to reach out uh, with any questions and um, obviously reach out to Dr. Gray as well with, with stuff on the book. So thank you.